In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, um, we finished up chapter 2 last week. Um, and as you may recall, I have commented that Philippians, if, if you had to describe Philippians in one word, it would have to be joy or rejoicing. He almost drives that into the ground uh, in, in the book of Philippians. Um, he talks about joy and rejoicing repeatedly uh, throughout probably more than any of his other letters to anybody. Also, um, as I mentioned to you again last week, uh, some of the best writing, and we're going to run up on another one uh, here in, I believe, chapter 4, if I'm not mistaken. Um, remember, in the first couple of verses of chapter 2, he says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from His love, any common sharing or fellowship in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit, and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but e each of you to the interests of others. Um, if you learn nothing else from this book, learn that. Um, and he's going to have another one here in a little bit in, in chapter 4 that is of equal value to this particular one. By the way, in talking about joy... Um, I was doing my usual morning routine of uh, scanning the internet for any news that might come up. Of course, I do it four or five times a day, but you could probably do it once every three days and you'd still get all the news you needed because they keep recycling it. But anyway, I was scanning the, uh, reading my email, what, such as it was, and scanning the news to see if anything was going on. And in my, um, in my filtering system for the news, I have one that filters to show me Knoxville Oak Ridge and, and Clinton news. And this particular piece came out. It said, Knoxville woman chooses joy while living with stage four breast cancer. And this woman's name is Lindsay Caldwell. And uh, the, the article starts, I'm not going to read you the article. I'm just going to mention a couple of words. It says, Lindsay Caldwell knows her disease is incurable. And she takes chemo pills every day. She says she has the power to keep going because of her friends, family, and faith. And she's 32 years old, and she's got stage 4 metastatic, which means it's, I guess that means it's spread to the rest of her body. It's not just in her breasts. Um, uh, she's got stage 4 metastatic uh, breast cancer, and she chooses joy. That's hard, isn't it? It's hard to choose joy when you know that you're going to die not very long into the future. Well, none of us really knows for sure. I might die today. You know, you might also. So in, the same, in some sense, she just has a little more certainty in her case that she knows what's coming. And I know and understand that we all have brain, different brain chemistry. And so it's not as easy for some people to make a conscious decision to, to be joyful. Uh, it's always been easy for me. I was born with wonderful, happy brain chemistry. And so I, I find it easy to be joyful even in bad situations. It doesn't mean I'm always joyful, but I'm, it's easy to, to get to joy for me because I'm just basically a happy person. It you know, doesn't matter to me. But I know some people's brain chemistry doesn't permit that, so I'm, I'm sorry but you still have some choice. You may not have as much choice as I do, but you have some choice to decide to lean in the direction of joy. And even if that only improves your joy by 5%, take it. Take it. If that's all you can do, take that 5%. It's better than not having that 5%. Choose as much joy as you can, regardless of your life circumstances. And that's kind of what Paul is teaching here. He gets into this even more as we continue. Yes? Before you get any further on that, what has concerned me as a preacher over the years of people loving this life more than the life that is yet to come. Okay. Uh, that's when they don't want to die. Yes. Uh, death is, is sort of like just moving into another room, uh, another phase of our life. It's sort of like 
the differences between when we're born and when we become a toddler and become a youth and become a teenager and then become an adult. Each of those levels are something different in our life and we don't expect to go back to those. And yet, Although Tyra would argue with you about that in my regard. She thinks I've reverted well, to an eight-year-old, but continue. Well, I, people kind of act like they do sometimes, but it's, it, it's not possible. Really. Yes. Uh, and the, the concept of, of dying uh, it may be scary, the fact that we're going to, to lose uh, contact with our family, we're going to lose contact with our friends, but we have so much more that is ours uh, when we get into that spiritual realm of life. When we're a child of God, uh, it's, it's a tremendous blessing to get out of this life. It is. It is. In fact, I think I've talked rather extensively about that in here in the past, and we need to keep remembering that. I'll tell you why human beings have a problem with this. Human beings don't like any change, even good change. We want things to stay exactly as they are, even if it's not that great. We except don't want for, change. Except for getting a raise. Oh, except for getting a raise. By the way, that only works for about a month. That's, a raise only works for about a month, and then it's just part of your income again. Um, so, you know, getting a 20% raise doesn't, uh, doesn't make you happy for the next two years. It makes you happy for the next two weeks. That's what it does. Um, but we don't like change. And a good example of that is the, the climate changing. You know, we are, we, are, we are just crazy, depending on which side of the, well, maybe no matter which side of the fence you're on, we have crazy people just absolutely ab abhorrent at the idea that the temperature might increase a degree or so. Um, Would you rather it went down a degree or so? No. You want it to stay the same. Well, I'm sorry, the climate never stays the same. It always changes. And there is nothing you can do to prevent it. So you're just going to have to get used to that change regardless. By the way, we are past any point that we might be able to stop it. So even trying to stop it is a waste of time at this point. Whether we call it, contributed to it or not, it is too late. So we are going to warm up a bit. And guess what? We have now, because of all that extra carbon dioxide in our air, we have a 5% increase per year in the amount of green biomass on this earth. Nobody talks about that. With all of our clearing of the forests and everything, the biomass, the green matter on this earth is increasing at a 5% per year rate and that is because carbon dioxide is plant food, <laughs> in case you didn't know it. And so our bad things is actually turning out to be good things for the plants. So the plants shall inherit the earth. Okay, so, but, but um, Bill's comment is, is important. Um, we, this is just a temporary thing for us. We should be joyful in this time, and we should be especially joyful that we have an even better time coming. Uh, now that doesn't say, that, and you heard me say, you should be joyful in this life too. You shouldn't constantly be going, oh, I wish I were dead, I wish I were dead, I wish I were dead, you know, because I want to go to heaven. Okay, that, that's unrealistic. Uh, and if you feel that way, maybe your life is so bad that maybe it would be good. But um, a song went through my head uh, last night, as a matter of fact, and I haven't heard this song in forever. And you're going to recognize it. Lead me gently home, Father, lead me gently home. And I can't do the high note there. I pitched it too high. Um, but it's a song about going home to God and asking God to take you before you fall by the wayside. Lead me gently home. Uh, I haven't heard that song probably in 30 years. Uh, I think it's still in the book. But we used to sing it a lot when I was a kid. And it's a beautiful, beautiful song. Um, but that might need to be more of our attitude. You know, Father, I'm ready anytime. Lead me gently home. Um, what's the uh, song? Let me never, no, never outlive my love to you. Um, I can't remember the rest of the song. But anyway, it says, don't let me outlive my love to you. So these are, these are concepts that are difficult, I think, sometimes for us to, uh, 
to accept. So last week we had gotten up to chapter 3 uh, and had stopped right there. And it says, Further, my brothers and sisters, oh my goodness, there's the word again, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again. In fact, he said it several times already. So he says, I've already written this to you, but I'm, I'm doing it again and again and again. Rejoice in the Lord. It's no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Rejoicing is a safeguard. What do you think that means? It might mean different things for different people, but living a joyful and rejoicing life protects you, I think, from some of the sadness of life, or at least softens the sadness that you might experience in life or the difficulties. It's a safeguard. It protects you. Watch out. Oh, before I go on from that, um, let's see. Okay, he's going to mention again in chapter 4 um, essentially the same words. He starts chapter 3 with rejoice in the Lord, and then if you are um, paying attention, go to chapter 4. He says, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown stand... Whoops, missed it. Oh, okay, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. So he's... I, I think he means for us to rejoice. What do you think? I think so. Um, so, rejoice, chapter 3, verse 1. Um, watch out for those... Now, this is pretty mean. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. Now, it's not obvious who he's talking about yet, but it will be in a moment. For it is we who are the circumcision we who serve God by His Spirit and boast in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. Um, he's saying Christians are the spiritual circumcision. He, he talks in another place, and I forget where it is, about circumcision of the heart. Um, so he's referring here primarily, I guess, to the Jews. Uh, and he mentions this kind of thing in Colossians a couple of times. He mentions it in Ephesians. Um, so he, he has made the transition from a physical Jew, a member of the chosen people. And the Jews, bless their hearts, they thought that was a special blessing. It wasn't. They thought God had chosen them because they were special. No, he chose them because they were not special. He chose them because they were uh, small, insignificant, bad to, uh, to wander from God, selfish. Well, of course, that's probably describing everybody, but, but nevertheless, he chose them so that he could bring Christ into the world, not because they were so great. And they interpreted the fact that he had chosen them as meaning they were great, I'm sad to say. They were the anointed ones. Guess what? The anointed one usually suffers. And they have suffered, no question about it. So it's not a blessing to be a Jew. But Paul says here, I have, though I myself have reasons for such confidence that is in the flesh. The Jews based their belief that they were special based on their heritage, based on the fact that they were Jews. Paul says, if you want to play that game, I can play that game with you all day long. Let's, let's see how we do compared to each other. And he's, he's being sarcastic here. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, now he said don't do this, but he says if someone has reason to believe they have put confidence in the flesh, I have more. I can outdo you. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. His dad was a Pharisee. And as for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness, based on the law, faultless. Measure up to that. He says, I had it. I had it. I was a Jew of Jews. Now let's see what he did with that. But whatever were gains to me, 
I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage. That's the NIV. The King James, I believe, gives a better translation of that word. It says, I consider them to be dung. The word there is scubalon, which is basically the word they used for human refuse. I, yes, you. regard them as liabilities. Which version is that? The NET. What version is that? New English. Okay. I, it works, but it's not accurate, is it? <laughs> because dung can actually be a, a, a benefit if you use it in gardening. But um, anyway, I consider them garbage. A lot of the other translations say refuse. The King James says dung. That I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Now, that's the grace part. We're going to see the opposite of that in just a second. But keep in mind, when Paul points out all of this stuff that he had as, an, as a Jew, he doesn't mention the fact that he had a Ph.D. in law. Uh, highly educated at the feet of Gamaliel, a rising star. He was going to be a member of the Sanhedrin within three years probably. And he threw it away. And he was even grabbing Christians and throwing them in jail, contributing to their deaths and everything. And so who of all people would have changed? Do you, do you have something for me with Beth? Or? Okay, I thought maybe you had her in a virtual presence or something. Uh, she did that one time, and I thought that was very cool. Um, he had it all going in, in his life. And he threw every bit of that away to be a Christian. They spent the rest of his life trying to kill him. So he, he's talking about that right now. Though, whatever those things were that he just enumerated were gains to me. I now consider loss for the sake of Christ, for the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus of Christ Jesus my Lord. Um, not a righteousness of my own that comes from a law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I, now, that was grace. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. Now, he's switching gears on you here. Remember, he's the apostle of, of grace. Not that I have already attained, obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on. That sounds like some kind of activity on his part. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Jesus didn't give him a lot of, uh, a lot of option or choice. You know, he came down and just kind of pounced on him in that vision because um, he needed him. Jesus wanted him big time. Jesus Christ took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward that, or straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win, there's another action word on his part, pressing on to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So he balances this. He says, I am saved by God's grace, but I am working like a dog. Remember, he talks about being worthy as well as, being, as, as, well as accepting the grace of God. He's pressing on. He's, he's fighting. He's contending. He's trying to, to reach this. The, um, there's another verse in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. And he's, remember, he made a reference here a little bit earlier to being... If I am poured out like a drink offering, I think we mentioned that last week. He says, if I am poured out like a drink offering, in other words, they just pour it out and waste it. If my life is just wasted, they just kill me. 
just pour me out like a, like a glass of wine on the ground. Just waste my life. It's okay. If we go over into 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 through 8, he uses the same metaphor. For I am already being uh, poured out like a drink offering. There's that thing again. And the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Notice he doesn't even mention grace there, does he? I've fought the good fight. I've kept the faith. But if you asked him what saved him, he would say grace, God's grace. But he says, I still have to get out there and fight every day. We have to do that. We, we can't just lay back and rock in the arms of Jesus, you know. He expects us to get up off our haunches and get out there and do stuff. And I, I have harped and harped and harped on this. The grace is what saves you, but the work is what confirms that grace. It says, I've got God's grace. I'm out here working for him, doing what I can being ambassadors for Christ. All of us, verse 16, all of us then who are mature and would take such, uh, should take such a view of things as he has just described. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. In other words, do the best you can with what you've got at this point in your life. And if you feel a little bit differently on that, God will let you know what you need to do if you're looking, if you're looking. Um, so I think he's, he's giving people some uh, leeway there saying, you know, you may not be there yet, but just do what you know to do to this point. That's, that's all he's really saying. You can't do what you don't know, can you? Any more than you can know what you don't know. Uh, I was asked one time when I was submitting a license application for the, the scientific ecology group, where one of the, the company I helped start. Uh, I, <coughs> our license package was like that thick, and the state was very, uh, very kind to us. They said it was the best application they'd ever received. Uh, I don't think they'd ever received a big application before, so I, number one made it easy for it to be the best one, um, or the first one that was ever applied on a big scale like that. But anyway, one of the questions that came back to us was, have you considered all unanticipated events? How, how do I consider something that I didn't anticipate? That, that's impossible. And I wrote back, no, I have not considered all unanticipated events. However, I have considered every event that I thought of that had any kind of reasonable possibility of occurring. That... that is what they really meant to say, I hope. <laughs> but have you considered all unanticipated events? Have you considered everything that could possibly be considered? No, I have not. I have considered everything I thought of. Not, I can only do what I know to do or what I can learn to do. And this is true with God. He says, do what you know. Do what you already have attained. And quit worrying about, well, do I know enough? You know, you've heard people say, I don't know enough to do anything for the Lord. And that's usually associated with teaching somebody else. I guess, I don't know enough to teach another person to be a Christian. Yeah, you do. Just do what you already know. That's all you have to do. If, if you don't know how to say anything to another person, show them. Can you show how you're a Christian? Well, I don't know. Uh, well, can you practice good things around a, another person? Surely you can do that. Well, what kind of good things? Anything. I don't care what it is. Just something good. Or don't know to do. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's all he expects of any of us. That's why he says that in, in, in certain, certain words, I can't remember the exact words, but basically the more talents you have, 
the more is expected of you, in essence. If you don't have much in the way of talent or ability, that's all God expects of you, whatever you have in your hand. That's all he expects. You don't have to be a great teacher or do, you know, or, or perform miracles or whatever. You just have to be what you can be. That's all he asks you to do. It's almost like playing poker. Some people are dealt royal flushes, rarely. They almost can't lose. But if you're stupid, you can still lose with a royal flush in your hand. Some people are dealt what they call fistful of garbage. And all God expects you to do if you're dealt that fistful of garbage is play that hand as well as you can. That's all he asks. You're probably going to lose in that case, in, in, in the analogy of, of a poker hand. But I have seen people on these professional poker shows, which I haven't watched in several years, it got boring, take a fistful of garbage and win the pot. <laughs> Just by sheer arrogance and bluffing. You know? <laughs> Just, it's unbelievable. You don't always have to have a royal flush to win. You can do it with a fistful of garbage. You may have been dealt half a talent. <laughs> for your whole life. Play that half a talent as well as you can. That's all he wants from you. If you have 10 or 20 or 30 talents, you got a big responsibility. So maybe we shouldn't pray for lots of talent. Uh, and maybe we should be a little careful in that regard. Because the more talent you have, the more God expects you to use those talents. With, with talent comes responsibility. So... Take joy, perhaps, in the fact that you only have one talent, maybe, and go out and use that one talent if that's all you have, or two, or three. If you don't even use that one talent, what happens? I was fearful, Lord. You, you reap where you did not sow, and, and, you, and I hid my talent in the ground, and here it is. And the Lord said, get out of here. You're useless to me. One talent. Use it, use it, use it. Okay, so join together, verse uh, 17. Join together, and some people have accused Paul of being arrogant here. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Remember he talked earlier about the people who were preaching out of contention and trying to do him harm, but he says, I'm happy they're just talking about Jesus. I'm, I'm just happy they're talking about Jesus. He says, they live as enemies of, of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. There you go, Bill. Uh, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. If you look in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 16, he uses this phraseology again. He says, imitate me. But I believe it goes a little bit far. Uh, if you look a little bit later in 1 Corinthians, he says, imitate me in 1 Corinthians 4, 16. In 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. So he says, in other words, if you see good stuff going on in my life, do that. Do that. And you can tell, you know, you can tell when somebody's doing good things. You don't even have to know what their motives are. If a person is doing a good thing out of a bad motive, take the good thing and do that good thing. You use good motives. It doesn't really matter what the person's motives are except in their life and to them and their relationship with God. If you see somebody doing a good thing, imitate it. But do it with good motives in your case. So as you, this is one of the reasons that we have this gathering. is so that we can learn from each other and, and see good practices among ourselves and maybe sometimes a bad practice, and choose, I'm, I'm going to do that. I could do that. A good thing. And you see something that's not so good, and you go, you know, I'm, I'm really going to work hard to avoid doing that. We can have good and bad examples. Um, different people react 
to examples in different ways. My wife, Tyra, grew up, she, she and her brother are, are, are siblings. Uh, he's a couple of years younger than her. Tyra's parents were chain smokers her entire life. As far as I know, Tyra has never smoked a cigarette in her whole life. Her brother grew up a chain smoker. Same environment, different responses to the same stimulus. She chose not to do it because she saw it being done. He chose to do it because he saw it being done. And so if you look at something bad that somebody's doing, you could go either way on that one, especially if it's somebody you admire, like a parent. So we need to be discriminating in our, our views of, of what's good and what's bad. And it's easier to do than you think. I mean, some people, well, I just can't tell. Yeah, you can, you know, in your gut. Unless you've got a completely messed up conscience, you know what's good and what's not. That's the sad part. I almost always know when I'm doing the wrong thing. Sometimes it takes me two or three seconds to realize it, but I know pretty quick. Quite, I've gotten to where now when I am condescending to somebody, and that is one of my faults. I get condescending if, if people don't seem to understand what I'm trying to tell them. You know, um, I can get pretty condescending. And I have, now that I'm 70 and a half years old, it takes me about two seconds to go, oh, man, thank God, you know, especially with Tyra because she comes down on me like in a millisecond when I do it. <laughs> and I, I'm trying to get to it before she does. Um, but uh, we have our faults. We have our faults, and we need to work on those. Um, but when we see something good in another person, we need to say, you know, that, that's a good thing. And it wouldn't hurt to tell them. It wouldn't hurt a bit to tell them that, you know, I saw you doing that. I know what you did, and it was good. Uh, a number of you showed up Wednesday night for Trunk or Treat, um, and a number of you are in this room. How many hot dogs did you eat? Did you actually eat 14 or are you just lying through your teeth here? Every time I walked outside to the table where hot dogs were being served, she had half a hot dog stuffed in her mouth. <laughs> they were good though, weren't they? Uh, sometimes old nasty hot dogs can be really good when you're just standing outside in the cool weather and just shoving them in. You know, <laughs> it'd be real tasty. Um, but a lot of people showed up um, to help with the many, many tasks that had to be done. In fact, I had my two garbage cans there from home and they had filled up with garbage and I had a couple of tubs to collect liquids in and by the time I could empty those two garbage cans in the dumpster and empty those two tubs of liquid, which turned out to be about 30 gallons, the table and cha tables and chairs were put away. I didn't even have to lift a finger to help with that. And didn't you wipe them all down with a wet rag or something? I know you were asking where you could find a wet rag. Sometimes we don't even do that, but at least you intended to do it, whether you did it or not, <laughs> but you did, right? Um, people were doing all kinds of tasks. Usually I would help somewhat with the, with the inflatables and everything. Not, not Well, sometimes I helped people get in and out, but mostly I was keeping them running or infl deflating them or something. I didn't have to do anything this time on that because we had enough help this time that stepped in. And it was a joy to be out there and just have a good time and just do your little job and, and do it well, Paula, Rubrites, uh, others of you uh, that were there, and I'm looking at several more. Um, but there were lots more people out there, it seemed like, this time helping than in, than in the past. And the, the work just, just went. It was wonderful. And so I very much enjoyed that whole experience uh, Wednesday night on that. Okay, so let's do what we can in the family, in the body, to contribute to the growth and the health of the body and follow examples of those people that we see around us that are doing good things and uh, thank them when you see them doing good things. It is? Share that with other folks. This thing says it ain't bragging if you did it. <laughs> like they say, it's not conceited if you're good. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> uh, coughed up my heart. Um, so, it, yeah, there's a fine line there between bragging and just letting other people know. Sometimes I will tell you things that I have learned to do and did, not because I want you to think I'm so great, but because I know that was a good example of it. I, I honestly don't want your praise for that sort of thing. But uh, that's, And I'm always afraid to point out things that you do. I think I've mentioned before that if I praise a person 
for their humility in their presence, I've robbed them of their humility immediately. If I go, you're just the most humble person I know, if that person even for a millisecond goes, yeah, he's right, it's gone. That's why I tell you I'm so proud of my humility, you know. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. You know, inside, even for a millisecond, if they think, yes, I am a humble person. Oh, it's gone. Oh, it's gone. So we, we need to be careful, and we don't need to be constantly going to a person on, a, on an hourly basis telling them how good they're doing, but we need to kind of pick and choose. And, and praise works better if it's not too frequent and not too predictable. Praise works better if it's kind of infrequent but still occurs and is unpredictable. I think I told you about how we used to walk around at SEG. The, the president and I would walk around with $5 bills in our pockets and we would walk by somebody doing something good and we would say, good job, and just hand them $5 and keep going. We got more work out of people by doing that. And next time I went by, the guy would be looking at me going, you know, working like a dog. And I go, good job, just keep going. <laughs> he goes, I didn't get my $5 bill. Apparently, I'm not working very hard. So he'd work even harder the next time. And I'd walk by him again. Good, doing good. Good to see you. How are you today? And just keep going. He goes, I didn't get my $5 bill. So he goes out and he does three more big things. And I walk by and I go, oh, good job. Hand him. Ah, oh, I worked hard enough to get another $5 bill. That works better than a raise. We got people to work their tails off by just occasionally handing out a $5 bill. Some guy would go, I got two $5 bills today. Well, I didn't get any. Well, you need to work harder. You know? <laughs> it was amazing what you could do with random, as long as it was deserved, random and somewhat infrequent praise or rewards pay off much better than a guaranteed reward every time you do something good. They actually do. So keep that in mind. You can shape people into you know, doing just about anything you want them to do with that kind of stuff. It's dangerous. Okay, follow his... Uh, okay, we're over. So we are at the end of chapter 3. What do I do with my pen? Um, we need to follow the examples of people around us. We need to have a proper view of our relationship with Christ and to press on toward the prize, as he says, the high calling in Christ Jesus. Today is the 28th of October. It's amazing. Um, so, um, may Christ increase your joy in the Spirit, and may he motivate you to do good to others wherever you can. Through Christ Jesus, amen. I actually finished on time.